Good Tuesday night to you, and thank you very much for joining us. I am Tabum Dooley. Human settlements is one of South Africa's biggest sticking points, particularly in developed provinces such as Gauteng and the Western Cape. Informal settlements have become prevalent around the cities, and land grab incidents are common as the housing backlog continues to grow. Tonight, we talk to four cooperative governance and human settlements and traditional affairs MECs to find out what their governments are doing to address these issues. Issues. Joining me from the Northwest uh, Human Settlements, MEC Moloki Twaile, who is with me here in the studio. It's good to have you, sir. Hi, Billy. And we also have uh, with us uh, on uh, the uh, line, Nongleba uh, Nkonchiwe from the Eastern Cape. MEC, good evening. And uh, MEC in Limpopo, Paiskopo, Makamu, as well as uh, from the Western Cape, Tertius Simmers. Good evening to you all, and thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, tonight here on the News Feed Late Night. I'll start with you, MEC, because you are in close proximity, so I can I immediately access you. Interesting remark made by the Minister of Public Service outlining some of the issues that um, we're dealing with. He says, your province is the only provincial department that underperforms. In fact, he says, the Auditor General's disclaimer and adverse finding is something that needs to be addressed. Let's start there. What's going on? The Women Settlement uh, Department is one year old. It was initially joined by a Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. When the Auditor General arrived there, the records were still with uh, COCTA. And disclaimer means there are no records to make any opinion on it. How are we redressing? We have established a team. We have been able to access records and made them available and invited the AG to review the status of our records. And uh, we have also been able to access the ledger account and documents are available. This suggests that we'd completely have a better result. Yeah. Did you pay bonuses? Uh, not, not really. Not really. Yes. Why didn't you pay for this? I would know the processes of performance management and development system takes long. Yeah. Yes, would you usually pay late? Probably this time there shall be no one who deserves any increment. Be, 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 <laughs> because the minister was very clear to say um, no bonuses must be paid, particularly for departments that are underperforming. Yes, we agree. Um, there has been multiplicity of our approaches for redress, and uh, of course we are making redress. All right. Let's have a look then at some of uh, the uh, uh, targets that you've set uh, for yourself, particularly uh, for this financial year and what you are planning to achieve. You've got about a population of close to 3.7 or so million people living there currently. Uh, and maybe it's a little bit more at this particular point. However, uh, one of the challenges that you are dealing with is uh, contractors and poor performance of contractors and, and consequence uh, management. You've got two projects that are done. In fact, by your own count, you're saying there are 32 projects that are blocked or that are currently not uh, doing what they are supposed to be doing. Let's look at uh, Kanana and let's look at Duflech. Uh, What's happening? Of course, uh, we have a multiplicity of problems around Kanana and Duflech. You would know that there were hostel dwellers who were located in the temporary shelters for the last four years. We are struggling with getting them proper houses, but you would know others would have benefited in other provinces and the system would reject them. Secondly, we've got a problem of a dolomite uh, in the area and that is why the, there are holes there. Uh, but we, are, we have identified areas where we are establishing township, but it takes 18 months to have a township established and well proclaimed. And uh, we have the situation where at the initial stages of deliverance of houses, you would have the toilet, the foundation, or at the second stage, it will be a toilet, one room, a title deed. 
subsequently it was two room. Another challenge is the quantum changed where the people were given 45 square meters and when the contractors did not complete the work, we had situation where the quantum changed to 40 yeah. and the people are still demanding 45 and their foundation is 45. That is a serious problem that we are working on it. Yeah. But you would realize that we have built 269,700 houses to this date. Just only on the last 10 years, we spent 17 billion. But we showed the work of contractors seriously disappointing and many of the blocked project is because of the decision by the nhbrc that the quality of work was not good mm. and those are the challenges that we so are let, let's talk about one of the issues that you raised the issue of holes i mean we covered it extensively here at some point here on museum africa but the, also the question of leaking search right so the charge is uh, since the commencement of this project in Bufle, um, uh, the building, right, are built very close to the sewage line. It's yes. one of the issues. True. Um, uh, the other issue that uh, is being raised is they are built very close to, to, to cables. Now, there are two things here. It's either it was poorly planned uh, or the, you're saying the contractor was just doing their own thing and they were hard-headed and they didn't want to listen to, to the advice of experts not to build on those lines. You would know that when you build houses, you also use 2% two, two of your capital uh, budget for purposes of uh, sanitation infrastructure. And if it is not well planned, it's a problem. But if the connection uh, to the existing infrastructure dictates otherwise, it is also a problem. But even where you have established a township, but we have not started to construct, and the, cab uh, the cables, uh, poles are put up there. So it's a multiplicity, but we agree also with the issue of poor planning yeah. on and around that area. But that project is already over budget, let me see. As we speak, it's not even complete. I mean, uh, none of the 360 are completed, unless there's something new that has developed now. NHBRC had to stop the... Uh, contract on the basis of the shady work. We are unblocking that project. We are getting the new service provider in this financial year to complete the project. We are making efforts even to resolve 10 year, 15 year backlog. What does it mean? It means that it is a demand on our present budget, we, which creates some form of limitations for us to have seriously ambitious target. Yeah. And that is why we have uh, reduced our tangent uh, yeah. uh, substantively. So you're saying to me you have abandoned the Biki Biki Magmir approach of 10,994 constructed and 4,453 sites serviced. Are you saying those targets are no longer applicable? As we those say? are targets on the basis that we have made available other funds for the purpose of resolving back, uh, backlog. Had we said, look, we are not going to do anything with the backlog, we would have more numbers. How do you complain about budgets when you are insisting on continuing a contract, right, that is already doubled in the amount, in fact, 300%? the king's contract. You want it to be extended by another 18 months. Yet you say you, you don't have money. And people will not believe that you don't have money. Why do you want to continue the contract that has already expired? We do not continue with the same contractor. The beneficiaries are waiting to receive their houses. We are making redress for the maximum benefit of the beneficiaries, but we are using alternative contract. However, the areas where there was uh, non-compliance either on the basis of the budget and so on are subject of investigation. This forms part of what the SIU must deal with over and above the internal processes where we must then blacklist companies. We want to recover the money that uh, has been lost by the public, uh, from the public. But my question is a little bit more specific. I'm talking about the Kings and Associate contract, which initially was 122 million, which has now ballooned to 500 million uh, from the time that it was uh, uh, initiated. And you wanted 
that contract. I don't know if you still want that contract extended by another 18 months when Treasury is saying to you, no more payments will be made towards this contract. On my arrival, they have terminated the contract. The contract is there up until end of May. However, there are issues in relation with the township establishment that takes longer. We have requested that Treasury must consider which project must be left in the hands of uh, that company, but we are advertising a contract. We are advertising the district-based uh, project management teams that would be coordinated at the level of the province because of the uh, district model approach, uh, development model approach. Now, what does it mean? We are going to have this uh, consult, uh, pro PMUs at the level of the district with only one at the level of province coordinating not but uh, maybe on and around 5% of the total cost. So we are doing away with that contract. That contract was there as far back as 2016. Uh, it was supposed to be for three years. Uh, it is on the fifth year and definitely we are making redress. The Premier made a clear instruction on moving quickly because when it remains there, everyone blames Premier. When he found it there as well but we we have terminated the contract it has come to an end in terms of the termination letter by the end of this month now the other challenge that you face with as far as your performance is concerned is the announcement by treasury that a uh, uh, hundred million uh, of your budget will be taken to to other projects because uh, you underspent yes it's true that we have lost hundred million uh, we have had some consequence management affected. In terms of um, Section 39, the head of the department assumes the responsibility as of accounting officer. But if you fail Section 38 of the PFMA, you use Section 36 to make any other person the accounting officer. And uh, for stabilization for some time, we had to delegate that responsibility to another person. And the correction that we have put in place would allow us that on and around September, we can get more than what we have lost. So the correction that we are putting in place is a correction that wants us to move with necessary speed. We have dissolved the bid committees and we, are const we constituted the new ones. The, the problem was we had people in the bid committees who did not fall within my prerogative and the competence, who came from national departments and other departments, and they would not always be there. Clearly, the direction is we must compose these committees using the internal personnel, and it's what we are doing, and we are hoping on moving with speed. If you are not processing this through the committees, you are not going to be able to spend. It is not only on that area b uh, that we have performed poor and we lost the money, but. We, we could not deliver many other things, including the uh, title deeds restoration because of the conveyor uh, contract and so on. Those delayed some processes, and our weakness is also on delivering houses to the military veterans. But we have budget sufficient for this financial year to redress on all that backlogs. And, of course, we have said, given that the person who was a delegated accounting officer responsibility is, has, has his contract uh, uh, coming to the end. Of course, we have made sure that the HOD resumes the responsibility and we have a clear plan of action with timelines that the HOD must just run and we are going to redress where we are both the HOD of local government, traditional affairs, and human settlements are on acting basis. We hope that we will have post uh, advertised, but we are moving. We are making redress. MEC, stay with us. So we'll take more of your questions and your thoughts as well for the MEC tonight at Newsroom 405-072-110-558 for the Human Settlements MEC in the Northwest Province. We'll continue next. We go to Limpopo, the Eastern Cape, as well as the uh, Western Cape. The Newsfeed Late Night continues in a moment. Newsweek Late Night continues for you here on Newsroom Africa Channel 405 in conversation tonight uh, with uh, Human Settlements MECs in the Eastern Cape, Limpopo, 
uh, as well as the Northwest Province and uh, the Eastern Cape uh, tonight. And of course, taking your views and your thoughts on Twitter at Newsroom 405 on the WhatsApp number 072-110-5584. MEC Makano, we come to you. In 2019, the DA writes, you didn't meet your target set for 80,600 houses in that five-year period of administration, which means when you came in in the sixth administration, uh, you had a backlog of 34,000 houses that still needed to be built. Yet you continued to set yourself more targets, so at least 8,896 in the 2019-2020 financial year. Are you just merely setting targets or is there a real desire and political will to deliver on these targets? Thanks, uh, Tavo and the viewers. Uh, I must indicate that I'm aware of the figures that you're talking about. You will understand that uh, the provision of houses, uh, it's something that will be develop developmental in the regard that when this project of providing houses started in 1994 by the then Minister of uh, Housing, then uh, the late Joslovo, the numbers will be fewer. But every year, there will be an increase of people who require these services. So we we'll continue to be following what the state South Africa say, but also what our what councillors will be doing to give us the numbers. If you go to a particular village uh, in 18... 19 financial year, you will have found maybe about 20 people requiring houses. But if you go there today because of the extension and poverty that is affecting our people, you may find that the number has increased. So we keep on re revising our uh, targets, but we could keep on trying to want to meet them. But you will know that this will also go hand in hand with the resources that are available at hand. So I can ag agree to say we have not yet met our target. The day we meet our target is the day that we will no longer have anybody like it was, it was envisaged by the Freedom Charter that there shall be houses, security and comfort. We continue with that very uh, document, but we are not necessarily moving because of the resources that we have, but we continue to be revising our target so that we can uh, meet uh, them. As the, we the, the target have, setting approach, is it a viable approach, I mean, in, instead of fixing the deficiencies in the system? Because as, as we sit now, if you continue to set targets, having not finished the 34,000 backlog, you are now adding to it with another target that you're setting, having not addressed what is already lagging behind. This is a very unique situation of providing houses in the sense that the 34,000 that we will have set in the previous fifth administration, as we speak now, it could not necessarily be the entire 34,000 that are still looking for the houses. It could be that some of those people have just got employment, they are working, some have uh, got bigger houses that you cannot necessarily qualify to receive the house. But what is it that it helps us to keep on revising and reviewing our targets? It gives us to assess our progress to say, what is it that we have been able to achieve? What is it that is outstanding? How do we deal with the outstanding? In some instances, you will find a situation where you go and find and engage with some household that we, you were on the waiting list, you were supposed to get the house, but simply because of your situation has changed, we can be able to take the house to a next door. So those are numbers that will keep on moving and have to be updated. And as such, we should have a figure that will be able to guide you as whether you are achieving, because you can't just simply see this government and say, we will build houses without setting targets based on the information and the data that will be provided for by the state of South Africa, how many people. You will see, as you have invited us here, that the manner in which I have informal settlement in the province of Lipombo and the minister in the Western Cape will be too different, and the manner in which we deliver our housing units will be too different yeah. depending on the current situation we but, find ourselves but, but your delivery of housing units has actually decreased, and um, you still have 5.5% 5 5 uh, of the population living in informal settlements. However, if you look at um, where you had set your target in 2018-2019 uh, and where you are uh, setting your target now in this financial year, you have fewer sites that you have allocated 
uh, for uh, uh, building new units. Why? Exactly the point. When we presented the budget, even previous year, we said we are going to utilize 1.3 billion for the housing uh, units. But this year, when we gave the budget, it was 914 million. You will understand that, Chavo, that because of the economic outlook of the country, the manner in which we are generating revenue as government, but also prioritizing some of the money that has to go and assist uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it will require to sacrifice some of the things. As we speak now, you said that we intended to deliver about 8,000 units. Because of the changes in the allocation, we are now targeting to deliver 5,000 housing units. So that in itself will show you that with the little resources that we have, we should be able to consider the number of units that we can be able to deliver. Right. So it's a, a balancing act that must happen here. As far as eradication of informal settlements, I mean, you are uh, targeting to service 3,179 sites to, through the IRDP. Uh, how many are you able to do? Look, we, we have planned, and I must indicate that uh, currently we are also uh, servicing sites and hand over to people that they can even build on their own. We're currently planning to deliver services without necessarily even a top structure to some areas close to 4,000 units uh, where we service sites in order for them that even if we don't necessarily have money to build houses for them, those that are able, we do that with what we call the rapid land release. With service sites, we hand it over to qualifying people. They can build their own top structures. So as government, we are now in the area where it's possible moving away just to build houses and allow people to stay there, which will not necessarily be sustainable as well give the services to the people. So uh, we have planned, and I think we'll be able to deliver on this uh, target of almost 4,000 units uh, of service sites. Formalized settlements, you have targeted six. How many have you delivered? I can confirm that we were able to conclude three of them that will be able to. The one which is very critical on our side is the Fenger Kral uh, Township Establishment, which is in Villa Villa, which we have already appointed contractors and uh, designers there that will be able to deliver almost 1,000 service sites, but also will continue to uh, construct about 250 top structures in order to start a new staff a township establishment. So out of those six which we targeted, three are already at an advanced stage that we can even start to construct uh, services and top structures. And as far as the whole question of money and underspending being um, uh, uh, raised, I mean, uh, uh, what is the real challenge here? I mean, if you look at uh, between 2014 and 2017, your department returned 1.4 billion rands. Uh, back uh, to Treasury, which was supposed to have been money that would have been spent to build houses? Well, I must indicate that the procurement process is another challenge. Hence, from 2016, you will have realized as a province that we were starting to have a appointment of contractors in a pool uh, format, where you appoint contractors for almost three years and be able to utilize them easily so that you should circuit the process of following the procurement process. And I think that has already improved a, a great deal. We are now improving. If you look at the previous financial years, we did not necessarily lose money except the current, uh, the just uh, 1920 financial year where we lost 50 million. You were talking to the MEC of Northwest, which they have lost 100 million. We are part of those teams, but already even in our case, we have realized where are the uh, shortcomings which we have identified that our project management unit was not necessarily up to scratch because contractors uh, were performing badly and then they were supposed to be terminated, some of those that are not performing up to scratch. And that process has been uh, started through some of the contractors who are not necessarily performing as expected. They're starting to receive letters to want to take some of the units that they have. But it's a whole value chain that will also talk to what uh, the MEC or my colleague from Northwest, that the, each and every person uh, in the process, because we require contract management to be in place, project management to be in place, but also a very quick decision-making 
that will be able to assist that contractors where they are not performing will take quick decisions and allow that we don't lose money because definitely that money was meant for people of Lipombo. And if you lose it, it means three or four people will be delayed to receive their houses and nobody should be able to allow that thing to continue. So you're emphasizing that you, you're changing the strategy as far as uh, rural and urban landscapes are concerned. So how you are approaching human settlement projects in Sukukuni, uh, Mobani and the Vembe district would be completely different to how you would be approaching that in an, in an urban setting. What is that change that you talk of? Look, definitely if you look at the available land within the urban areas, if in my case I will talk about Bulukwan. You cannot continue to want to build uh, those uh, RDP houses that will occupy land. Land is not available. It's a matter that gets to be uh, a subject for everybody. Hence, now Section 25 of the Constitution is being looked into. So obviously, already you can see that uh, we have started to uh, construct CRUs uh, that will be able to allow people in very small uh, three-story or double-story buildings that will co continue to construct because of the limited land that is available. So we are no longer going to do like we're doing in a rural village where the chief has got uh, apple, uh, apple uh, land that we can do this. So already say we have started to do that. We have constructed uh, a Sishiko CRU. We are busy with Marapong uh, CRU. We will be going to a Chikota CRU. We'll be constructing a Talani CRU in an effort to make sure that we don't necessarily utilize land which could be utilized for some other development issues only for housing uh, settlement. MEC Vakamus, thank you very much. Stay with us. I will take some more questions for you as well as uh, the news feed late night continues. We're in the Eastern Cape and look at what's happening in the Western Cape as well. Take your questions tonight at Newsroom 4050721015584. It's the MEC's round table on delivery on human settlement in the Northwest, in the Eastern Cape, in Limpopo, as well as the Western Cape. The news feed late night continues next. Welcome back here with the Newsfeed Late Night and the conversation tonight around the delivery on human settlements in the Northwest, the Eastern Cape, the Western Cape, as well as Limpopo. The MECs are with us tonight and we will take your questions in a moment uh, as uh, we continue with the show. Let's uh, bring in uh, the MEC now in uh, the Western Cape. MEC uh, Tersha Simmons, good evening and thank you very much uh, for your time. You are inundated currently with... Uh, a number of land invasions. I think 1,078 attempts of illegal land invasions across the Western Cape. Are there an indication of the extent of land hunger or the indication of the uh, extent of the slow pace of response as far as addressing those needs? Which one is it, MEC? Well, <clears throat> quickly, just to update you, the current figure is 1,149 land invasion incidents across our province and ultimately a small portion is can be contributed to those individuals that have been waiting on the housing demand database for quite a quite a long time but ultimately the majority of these land invasions are actually driven by opportunists by individuals who would have never ultimately qualified for an opportunity and we are seeing the emergence of what we call slum lords basically who are actually driving these invasions getting filthy rich through these processes so ultimately, uh, this is not purely a needs-driven uh, land grabbing that we are seeing across the Western Cape, and the cost of these land grabs are ever so uh, more increasing, and it, it's being done at the expense of individuals who are law-abiding, who have been waiting on the housing waiting list for, for quite a while, and ultimately, well, they will now unfortunately have to wait longer because, sadly, we are seeing the rise of criminality and opportunists within certain communities within our province yeah. that are now seeking to, to capitalize on the fact that under the current um, COVID regulations, certain things cannot do, be done by the relevant local governments. So, yeah. Have you been conducting evictions? The minister quite uh, clear around that particular point that no evictions, uh, as well as no land invasion, I must say, uh, 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 to be conducted during this time. But it is alleged that you have been evicting people. Well, ultimately, I can say from a provincial perspective, we have not been, been doing that uh, due to we are our respect for the rule of law. Where this has occurred across our province in specific municipalities, your listeners and uh, your viewers need to understand that the municipalities already had 
um, the relevant legal requirements and documents in hand to actually exercise their right to protect state-owned land in their custodianship for future use. So I just need to put that correction because sadly for over the last few months, the incorrect picture has been portrayed about what's actually been happening regarding these land invasions and our attempts and our uh, local government swears to protect the land well, which ultimately they have ownership and they have responsibility for future usage. Yeah. Let's look at uh, some of your targets and uh, plans that you have put in place. I mean, with a similar level of informal settlements in the Western Cape as that which you find in, in Gauteng and uh, I suppose in the Northwest as well uh, at this particular point at about 19% or slightly above that. The number of uh, approved human settlements projects, if you're looking at your program two, live, livable neighborhoods, uh, was 10. Quarter one, you achieved none. Quarter two, only two at the moment. Oh, no, I, I do take note of that, but you do need to understand that our targets are set in realistic terms. Uh, what we report on is in accordance with what the National Department requires from us. But I can tell you that we are the only province consistently that has proven that we actually not only come close or to accomplishing our targets, but even exceeding our targets like we've done for many, many years, to such an extent that the National Department, where it takes money from other provinces, we have consistently been the recipients of additional funding through adjustment appropriations for quite a number of years because as a provincial government and department, we have the absorptive capacity and ultimately we do finish our projects for which we get the funding. But quarter one and quarter two, ultimately we are now in quarter one of the, of the current financial year which means we are being doing assessments of the previous year's projects to verify and audit that what has been built is built, what has been completed is completed, and ultimately we will start seeing an incremental improvement between the second and the third quarter and ultimately a full acceleration on delivery in the fourth quarter of the current financial year. Yeah. It has been our historic pattern as a province. Yeah. How, how much land have you acquired in this financial year for purposes well, at the of, moment, of, of human settlement? As a provincial government, if I include our local government sphere, we have just well over 130 hectares of human settlements, lands that, is, that is developable. And we've also requested the National Department of, of uh, Public Works and Infrastructure, because they own, also own vast pockets of land across our province. Ultimately, that is, is still hanging in the air. So from provincial side and with our partners in local government, we have done well over 130 hectares, and I must emphasize land that is developable for human settlements, because every portion of land that you look at can actually be developed for human settlements in our province. Yeah. As a percentage in terms of your target, because uh, previously uh, you only were able to acquire at least 6% in the previous uh, uh, administration. Well, given the, the, the norm over the past three years as a province, we've spent between 6 to 10% on the acquisition of land, so we are on track as well for this current financial year to attain the same. Okay. Uh, let's talk then about the, the number of established uh, townships, or at least the processes, right? You say you have a process that uh, you need to undertake that would ensure that there are amenities, uh, they are livable, there are economic opportunities. You had set yourself a very low target of uh, four townships uh, to be uh, established uh, using those devices. Um, so far, you've reported on none. Well, as I said, we are currently in the first quarter and we are reviewing what was done in the previous year, year where we did reach our target and we set realistic targets in the Western Cape, which we do attain and the four is attainable given the period it takes to establish new townships. And once again, if you look at the third and fourth quarter of the current financial year, you'll see the acceleration of these processes and at the finalization of the current financial year next year on the 31st of March, that four would have been attained. Yep. That is realistic targets. You, you, you place a lot of emphasis on your rehabilitation initiative, consumer rehabilitation uh, uh, in initiative, which currently has about uh, uh, 20 or so people who have gone successfully through it. Uh, you're expecting to, you're targeting 50, and you're expecting in the fourth quarter to get another uh, 30. Tell us about what the policy is there. Well, basically, the, the program you are referring to is the credit readiness program, which is part of FLISP which is the finance linked individual subsidy program in the Western Cape. We've also identified obviously the need that certain of our possible beneficiaries of the FLIS program do need assistance from our provincial government. 
And hence we've set realistic targets because we've done this for quite a number of years. It takes the possible beneficiary through a program, getting them credit, credit uh, worthy, so that when they do approach a, a financial institution, that we, we are guaranteed that ultimately there will be qualifying beneficiaries of the FLIS product in the Western Cape. It's been a very successful program. We have also seen it uh, in certain areas across the Western Cape, ultimately ensuring that people also now work smarter with the, their income due to our intervention and assistance as a provincial department from a human settlements perspective. MSC Gonchiwe, let's talk then your target that you have set of 78,000 housing opportunities uh, in the province in this financial year. How much of that target uh, are you looking to achieve at this point? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good, good evening, Chabo, and the viewers of the uh, Newsroom Africa, Channel 405. We, we are really targeting to to meet the target halfway, uh, given the constraints of the budget allocation that we have. Uh, our target, uh, our main priority this financial year is first to unblock the blocked project. And with those, we are going to uh, cover most of the, uh, the number of the target that we have set up. Now, Minister, it said that one, one of the areas where there is a huge backlog, particularly in the province, is the uh, area of the handing over of title deeds. That uh, uh, particular project, you have a number of beneficiaries who have not seen that benefit. What is the challenge? The main challenge, Tabo, on that area is that the gap between the, the relations between the municipality and the department because the, the beneficiaries are kept in the municipalities. And then they also, that the beneficiary, the beneficiary list are always having a challenge that you don't have, you always have a challenge on the beneficiary list being changed, uh, this and that. However, this financial year, we have uh, resolved that we're working very closely with the municipalities in order for us to, to resolve this challenge of beneficiary list and be able to issue out the title deeds. We've already started the program of issuing out title deeds, working very closely with the municipalities in the province. Yeah. Thank so, you, Tabo. So what, what you're saying is that the, the question of the delays in the title deeds was because of inadequate capacity in the municipalities and you are now beefing that up? Yes, by working very closely with them because beneficiaries Beneficiary lists are with the municipalities. And therefore, the title deeds reside with the municipalities, of course, working with the department. So we have resolved now to work closely with the municipalities and prevent this issue of beneficiary lists being manipulated or changed or this and that. So we are, we are now monitoring that process very closely. Hence, I am saying we have been able to issue out a number of, them, of title deeds uh, through the municipalities that we're working with. Thanks, Tabo. Now, now, now ABC, you, you, you've just literally been appointed, so you just came into that position. Tell me what do you see as uh, a, a challenge as far as the municipalities being able to identify adequate uh, packages of land? There's a lack of capacity within the municipalities in the Eastern Cape to be able to identify packages of land that are adequate and that are well resourced and within the, the correct job opportunities uh, for the people. We, 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 we are able to identify these lands in the municipalities. As I'm saying, we're working very closely with them and see whether these lands, are, they belong to the municipalities and those then by us working with them. We are able to identify working with them and service those lands for the uh, for the residents or beneficiaries to get space and the houses be, be, being built. Even on the upgrading of informal settlements, our focus is to service the lands, provide the service, the basic services on those, so that they feel comfortable and the areas are at least habitable for them. Now. One of the other issues, like the other uh, departments, uh, particularly in Limpopo and in uh, the, the, the Northwest, you have also lost 21% of your key housing 
grant. Uh, how are you planning to uh, recoup, uh, correct that particular uh, situation of a loss of the grant? Indeed, we, we, we acknowledge that we have lost so much money, uh, about 338 million. We have resolved it. We have had some turnaround planning sessions and change things and so that we chase our targets. Our priority this financial year is to maximize the performance, especially to unblock the blocked projects and build houses uh, for the destitute. That's our main priority. By us maximizing performance on that area, we think that we, we are very sure that we are going to meet the targets. We are planning to uh, perform uh, adequately so that we don't lose money ever again. We don't feel good. We are very worried about us losing this money, but we are working very hard in terms of recovering what we have lost. And you see, I appreciate your time. Thanks for staying with us. We'll come back with some questions coming through on WhatsApp tonight, uh, as well as wrap up this conversation. You can send them through at Newsroom 405. Otherwise, uh, you can uh, send them on WhatsApp 072-110-5584. Newsfeed Late Night continues next. All right, back with you on the Newsfeed Late Night. And conversation continues now around human settlements in the Northwest, uh, in Limpopo, the Eastern Cape, as well as the Western Cape. Some WhatsApp messages for you, MEC, coming through today. Uh, this one from Comfort uh, uh, saying, uh, uh, MEC Joyle, my name is uh, Comfort, I suppose. Uh, we are facing challenges of water shortage, and our local municipality cannot intervene because they don't have water rights and uh, are uh, 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 maintained. Uh, this is in Kahisan. Tabani in Kleckstorp saying, Shabby work is the norm in our human settlement. When contractors build houses, there is no due diligence and evaluation of work done. Just tackle those two first. Yes, it's true. We have the district municipality as the water service provider. The local municipalities, uh, particularly in that region, and Ngakamuduru Mulema, are not having any authority on and around water in terms of the National uh, Water Act. We have e a challenge with the leadership of that district and we have invoked Section 1391B. We have had interaction with the Water and Sanitation Department and we've got a five-year reliability water plan. Over and above that, we've got a provincial infrastructure grant that we have just put through for the boreholes uh, uh, development around the area, but we've got plans for which we are mobilizing resources and we are making progressive uh, interventions. So we are addressing right. at on and around Kahisano Molopo and in the whole of the region. The question of the Kleckstorp and the quality of work that is being done. What, what, the the, 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 uh, before you tackle it, I mean, the one part of the question is the type of housing uh, that you are providing, right? Uh, it is said that you, you provide only one type of house that does not consider the varying household and the type of needs that they might, that they might have. But not only that, if you do provide that type of house, the quality of it uh, becomes very poor. The policy directive we, has, we have issued is that you cannot build a ready house for a disabled person and tell a person to come in. We are building a house now for this new financial year moving forward as a response to the needs of the beneficiaries. The shady work is true. It has been there. It is the serious problem. We, are, we have pro reorientated the department to the availability of a policy on how we must blacklist these companies. But you must know we've got about 60 or so um, inspectors who one would not necessarily say they are meeting inherent requirements, which is a very serious problem. But we are beginning the work to take them through the recognition of praline and even refer them for particular trade test. So we inherited this as, uh, from even Bupuda Joan. And we, the, the, to this far, we did not have much of the redress, but it is, there is a program to make redress. And we are increasing, we have made advertisement of many posts, and we are increasing our capacity to monitor and evaluate our work within, even before the NHBRC comes in.
This one on, on Twitter from Offense. It looks like a lot of questions for you tonight. That is, um, why is Moses Kotane allowed to sell the land earmarked for housing development for the people of Mohwase uh, to West Caesar Mine for staff accommodation whilst complaining about the lack of land for social housing? The issue of social and labor plans uh, corroborating or incongruence with the integrated development plan is our policy direction. We, where we are able to make land available for the mining, uh, to, for the mines to build for their workers, really we will appreciate where the municipality is assisting because it forms part of our responsibility. One of the responsibility of our department is um, uh, rehabilitation of mining areas and providing services because you would know that's where the people flock and that's where we experience even land invasion and that's where we have many of our people not uh, having decent sanitation they are using uh, latrines and so on so the partnership with the mines is what is also enabling us to deliver on our mandate. There is nothing wrong with it. It doesn't always work. At one it point, you are way. in partnership with them. At one point, you're complaining that they don't want to sell land, or at least they are asking exorbitant prices, and you now want to, to expropriate. How is that process going? Yes, of course, in terms of the Expropriation Act of 1978, not this bill in relation with Section 25, municipality, the provincial government and the national, uh, governments are able to expropriate land for public usage. We agree that at times because of financial crisis of the municipality, we find that they uh, want to sell land ex at exorbitant prices, but it is not that it should would prefer. We want that the land must be made available for that development, whether it is a municipality or any other developers. We would really appreciate where the land is made available in our province. There are 623 villages, only 22 towns, uh, I mean 12 towns with 23 townships. And we have an um, informal uh, settlement that affects on and around 1.3 million of our population in about 320 uh, varying areas. So if we really have uh, delivery of houses being made by any role player, we will uh, gladly avail the land, would persuade the municipality to intervene. That's what Particularly, we, I mean, the situation in the Marikana residents, I mean, are you planning to expropriate that land? Of course, it is in the process. We have signed the expropriation of the land around Marikana. But you must also know, even before you complete the process of compensation and so on, in terms of the 1978 Act, 80% of that land is already invaded. And... Uh, but we are going to have a township establishment, houses uh, built on and around there, will be building them, and we are going to avail bulk services. So we are making serious interventions because of the congestion there. We are also even having a fire station coming there. The problem with other areas is the property of the mines, where there are still some minerals under, but the people are just... Uh, there in the area, the mines do not agree that you must uh, bring the electricity, bring water, because they are not giving you that land. It's their land for their future expansion. Yeah. And now uh, people would do, do and say, but bring services. It's just like where in the farm areas, we've got people who are in, on private land, and it's very difficult to avail services. Whether it is about pamphlet, where the cabinet resolved that it, they must be disengaged the people from there and sent somewhere, but the high court decided that there mustn't be that move. We, you don't know whether you must move in and provide service. There are many complications on yeah. the matter that wants to uh, be assisted with some form of decision at another level. ABC Simmers, you face a similar situation with um, security of tenure with uh, residents who are on farms. How are you addressing that? Well, to be quite honest at the moment, we are looking in conjunction with our sister department of agriculture, how we can actually partner with quite a number of our, our farmers who are starting to avail pockets of land, the parcels of land, with, with, with the provision that, you know, ultimately those that inhabit their farm and work on their farm should be the beneficiaries. Uh, so we are working with our sister department to, to address that specific need in our more rural parts 
of the Western Cape, because unfortunately that is a bit of a hindrance the further you go beyond the peri-urban boundaries across our, in, in, in our province. Let me see, Makambo, you uh, had planned to have some kind of collaboration with a strategic partner, be it a mining, uh, be it a uh, private sector, as far as the provision of bulk infrastructure uh, is concerned. Any projects currently underway? Thank you, Chavo. I think uh, we have got uh, projects that we are running currently to rehabilitate mining towns, and we're working well with our uh, mining houses in the province. Uh, if you look at the area in Begasfort, in Tawazimbi, in Vilavila, in Mkhalakwena, we have got projects which are running, which we are partnering with our mining houses, just to make sure that there are services uh, that will go to the people, because uh, we may require uh, this water, but they may also require green, green water that we are working with them to make sure that mining also takes place so that we can be able to collaborate with them. So it's a matter that uh, it's going well with our uh, mining houses and uh, partnering very well, but also making sure that it could contribute toward the delivery of housing and bulk services within our areas. How many farms, very briefly, I have about 30 seconds, uh, farms that you have identified in the province for expropriation? Well, uh, you will see even next week we'll be waving the president and the minister of public works and the minister of rural development that will be giving uh, tightly this to some communities around Skukune uh, to show that uh, all the farms that they have been with government that should be able to be utilized by our communities. Uh, that is the one that is in the pipeline that you will be seeing uh, being handed over and tightly this to our communities which we are expropriating. So it's a matter that we keep on uh, engaging uh, government, other sector departments like Department of Agriculture where we can be able to develop for human settlement. MECs, let me thank you all for joining us tonight here on the Newsfeed Late Night. The Northwest MEC for Human Settlement, MEC uh, Moloki Jwaile, as well as uh, Nongleba Konchiwe from the Eastern Cape, Vaiskopa Makamu from Limpopo, and Tertius Simmers out in the Western Cape. And thank you for joining us tonight via WhatsApp as well as on Twitter. When we continue next, the ICU identifying Gauteng, KZN, and the Western Cape as corruption hotspots. What does it mean? We'll get those details for you when the news feed continues next. Your power.